So, I grew up in uh, Minnesota, small town, uh, Raymond and Renville, back in the 1950s and 60s, a long time ago. <laughs> My family was uh, somewhat frequent at church. And as a child, it, it seemed to me that if we made it there on Reformation Sunday, Reformation Sunday was that special day as Lutherans when we got to celebrate a victory over the Roman Catholics, right? <laughs> the Catholics had the law. Lutherans had grace, grace, right? Catholics were bound. Lutherans were set free. Yeah, see? Luther's rediscovery of God's great grace somehow, at least on that day, trumped the Catholics' focus on good works, right? Luther's eyes and ears and heart and spirit had been awakened and opened to the power, the depth, the breath of God's great, freely given gift of grace. There's no turning back, no turning back after that, right? So in a sense, Reformation for us as Lutherans was our Super Bowl. It gave us a chance for a victory parade. We could say, yay, we won, right? For the last 500 years, we are the champions, the theological champions of the world. Amazing grace. It once was lost, but now in Luther, it's been found again, right? Well, it could be that. After 500 years, I'm thinking that maybe we could take a little bit of time to look at what the options are that our neighbors face with us, those faith options that still tempt and taste, uh, test us today. Uh, today. Get my tongue on right. I'm going to ask you to hang in there with me. This sounds a little heavier than I like to preach. But uh, you might also check out the bulletin. If you have a pencil, you can circle one of those at some point, right? So this morning, I'm going to use the symbol of a mink coat. No offense to all you PETA members. I'm going to use the symbol of a mink coat for God's grace. A mink coat to represent the grace that God gives us in Jesus Christ, right? Mink coat, God's grace. Okay, hold on to that. And I do invite you to remember that, as Pastor Tom said in his sermon last week, he made reference to how God is the God of all the world, the whole universe, not just Christianity, and that God has given us a world full of neighbors to love. So, if you forget, I'll give you a coin. Okay. So, for some of our neighbors that we are to love and share God's uh, good word with, option number one is simply no faith, right? It's called atheism. Theos is Greek for God. Atheos, atheism means no God. So an atheist neighbor might say to us, no God, no Jesus, no mink coat. You come into this world naked, you go out of this world naked the same way. You're born, you live, you die, you're pretty much on your own. As the Disney cartoons used to say, that's all folks, right? <laughs> that's all there is. So be safe out there, or whatever, right? Their prophet might be that uh, torch singer, Peggy Lee. If you remember her song, is that all there is? Well, if that is all there is, then let's keep on dancing and break out the booze and have a ball. If that's all there is. Option number two was a real problem for early Christians especially. It's called Gnosticism. Right? Gnosis is Greek for knowledge, for having special inside knowledge about God and God's ways. Some folks believe that they had that knowledge and that you and I didn't. 
right? So any knowledge there is about God or Jesus or that mink coat of God's grace can only come through them. They were special, with special insight. You might think of uh, modern day, you might think of Scientologists, you know, Tom Cruise and Scientology as being Gnostic. They make a claim, insights they say, that nobody else has about God in the world. You wanna know what they know? Well, literally you sign over your soul to them for a billion years, and then you spend the rest of your life making hundreds of easy payments of tens of thousands of dollars, and they will teach you how to work your way up in and up in leadership. To know God, to rise up, you have to join up, and then you have to pay up. And I think you'd be smart if instead you just wise up, right? <laughs> Option number three is called agnosticism. It's a shadow of Gnosticism, right? If Gnosticism means having special knowledge, <coughs> Agnosticism means something more like, well, I don't know. I'm not sure what to believe. When it comes to God and Jesus and mink coats full of grace, many neighbors of ours simply say, well, they're not sure, right? Not sure what to believe. Not sure what is true. What God stuff could be true, or maybe it's not. A person just can't be certain, right? Our agnostic neighbors, I think, tend often, at least, to sit on the sidelines and watch, right? They, uh, they sort of step aside from the faith journey that we're on. And maybe they hedge their bets a bit with spirituality because it's, well, maybe better to be a little safe than sorry. When it comes to God's grace, well, wouldn't that be nice if we could prove it's true, right? Option number four for our neighbors is named for Pelagius, right? A fourth century Irish monk, strong believer in free will. Now he said, there is a God, there is Jesus, there is a mink coat of God's grace and love. And it's like, well, that's great. He's getting us there. So how do you get that quote? Well, there's a big catch here. You earn it. You work your hardest. You do your best. You be as good as you can be. And then maybe God in Jesus will pay you off in that mink coat of grace. It works like this. You have to find the mink kill the mink, skin the mink, tan the hide, sew the coat, make it yourself, and then choose to put it on, right? Pelagianism teaches us that God is full of grace, but you have to work hard to help save yourself, really. Modern Pelagians might be our neighbors, the Mormons, right? They teach that God's saving grace comes from your own hard work at being good and doing good, that the very best men, sorry, no ladies here, the very best men can work their way up from the ground floor to the penthouse of heaven, by the stairs, by the elevator, floor by floor, and then work their way to the penthouse. If you don't make it, you hope God grades on a curve. But if you do make it, you get to become a God just like Jesus, right? It's work, work, work to get God's grace. Early Christianity rejected Pelagianism um, because it's too much work <laughs> and not enough grace and not enough Jesus, right? So number five is semi-Pelagianism. <laughs> that sounds better. This happens to be how most American Christians believe when it comes to grace, right? 
It says there is a God, there is Jesus, there is a mink coat of God's great grace. It's the coat that Jesus wants you to have, to wear. It's full of grace and love and forgiveness and mercy. The good news is that Jesus has done it almost all just for you. There's not a big catch here. There's just one tiny, tiny little catch. One small step you have to take before that coat is yours, see? You have to want it. Or maybe you have to decide to accept it. Or you have to come forward and take it. That mink coat of God's saving grace for all the world is just sitting right there <laughs> in a pretty box for all of you. But it's not yours until you open it, right? It's not yours until you put it on. It's not yours unless you keep it on. Any idea who the most famous American semi-Pelagian might be? You'll be surprised. Billy Graham, yeah, right? His message, you all know what God has done for you in Jesus Christ, right? Now, come forward and accept it. You have to make your decision to open the box and put it on. It's a gift of grace, all right? Grace plus, well, you gotta say the sinner's prayer. Grace plus, well, you have to make a decision. Grace plus your commitment to Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, right? Saving grace, yes, but not until you do your little part. But you notice how all that, even little that it is, makes grace dependent on what? Your little part, right? So, Reformation Sunday. The last one we're going to talk about is to be an Augustinian, right? Augustine was a fourth century uh, North African young man, became a, a theologian, pastor and theologian in the church, after he discovered the Apostle Paul's focus on God's great grace in Christ. Discovered that it's a grace freely given, never earned, right? Augustine came to believe in God and Jesus and that mink coat of God's grace simply as God's gift, right? Now, Augustine was a young man, a party goer, a ladies man, um, a playboy. He had no time for the God of his grandma and his mama, though they kept praying for him every day. And God would work in his life. And then finally, God's grace broke into his life, was poured into his heart, his mind, and his spirit, just as it had been for the Apostle Paul. And he is now one of our main theologians all the way back to the fourth century, right? Which brings us a thousand plus years ahead to another theologian. Martin Luther was a what? an Augustinian monk, right? Now, he spent a bunch of his life living like a Pelagian, trying his best to be good and do good and, and please God. But in studying probably Augustine and the Apostle Paul and Scripture and the letter to the Romans, God's grace was poured into Luther's heart and spirit, right? All of those guys knew God's grace as a gift. Period. They learn that the grace of God, the forgiveness of God, is not found, not earned, or not merited, or for sale at any price. So here's the deal about this day. Reformation is indeed a special day. It's an Augustinian celebration. It's good news for everyone, not just Lutherans. It's a message for the whole world, right? So, think of that main coat of God's great grace. My assistant, Rebecca, will come forward, right? <laughs>
So, if you come stand here. <laughs> Your husband's going to buy this for you this afternoon. So, I'm giving it to you. Yeah. So hold on. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So thank you here. So, this mink coat of God's saving grace is given to you when? When you were baptized, right? For sure. It's your coat of many colors. It's your robe of righteousness. It's the swaddling clothes of Jesus Christ that you too have been wrapped in since you were born. It's what you're to be dressed in every day, good days, bad days, right? That saving grace coat was made for you when? Certainly on Good Friday, right? And it was sewn up for you on Easter morning. In fact, faith says this coat has been ready for you since before the creation of the world, right? For you and for the world, right? So remember this, Reformation is not just a day, but it's a message for all the neighbors of any stripe and denomination who still need to know, still need to know the great gifts of God's grace and faith and trust and to know them as a gift from a loving God, right? It's a message meant for the whole world, for every neighbor and not just for Sunday church, right? I think that grace truth alone makes this and every day a day worth celebrating. Once more, trust this coat is made just for you and God intends it for the whole world, right? It has Jesus' name in it <laughs> and your name as well. It doesn't come off ever, okay? You get to keep it, huh? Yeah. <laughs> God sees Jesus wrapped around you every moment of your life, right? Now, what you might uh, say and do is simply thank you, Jesus, right? And Jesus will say to you, you're welcome. You're welcome to wear this every day of your life, now and forever. That's grace. Amen. Thank you. You can just lay it there. Okay. The grace and peace of Mercy of God that passes our understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.